Hey there, everybody. Give me a quick shout out in uh, chat or questions. Uh, let me know if you can hear me. Yep, I see it. There you go. Uh, and uh, give us a second to get ourselves started here and to get people kind of in. Alexander can hear me. Remy can hear me. Okay, I'm going to broadcast in the audio now. Uh, you guys should be seeing our screens on Facebook Live. We're going to uh, Twitch, uh, YouTube, and also to uh, to um, to uh, Facebook and uh, and whatnot and GoToWebinar. All right, so uh, guys on GoToWebinar, um, do you hear any echo? No echo. Alex, do you want to talk for just a sec? Make sure there's no echo. Yeah. Is there any echo? Does it sound hey, well? Yes. Are I'm you sure. sharing your screen yet, Ryan? Yes, but it's it's uh, uh, in GoToWebinar. The screen's not shared. Okay. okay. All right. Now uh, I'm going to share now, though. Or actually, sorry, you're sharing your screen. Oh, I am. Yep. Are you sure it's not me? I'm looking That's at you, your, Alex. Who's on first? At, I'm looking at your screen. Yep. You're moving that around. Yeah, it's me. Okay. I switched you over to presenter. So, all right. Give me a second, guys. Make sure that we've got this working in all the different platforms. Some of these are new. Oh, let's do this. Okay. All right. Should be able to see my face if you're over on Facebook and you'll see Alex's uh, screen. So just another moment as we get this kind of sorted out. Okay. There we go. Geronimo, I see you over there on Facebook. Noel, I see you over there on Facebook. And let's check out Twitch because that's a brand new beast. All right, Twitch is going. A bit uh, degraded in the video quality, but that's going. And let's get rid of that. I have to do that again. Perfect. All right, the live screen is there. Live now. All right. So let me get rid of all of these. And uh, I'll keep that up. And here we go. One more second, guys. We're just we're trying something brand new, so I'm doing all of this to make sure that we're super clear. And uh, and there we go. I think we got it. You guys, uh, everything looks like it is in exactly where it needs to be. So let's just get this moving down the road. Okay. All right, so we're recording on a couple of different devices. We're broadcasting all over the place. And right now, if you see me in the lower corner, that means you're watching it live or you're watching it on one of the social channels. Um, and you'll see up here, you're going to see uh, the other direction. I have to mirror these things. Uh, you'll see Alex's screen. So um, we're going to start this conversation out with a bit of an introduction, get, get you guys to know who Alex is, what he does, maybe a little bit about what this job is that he does, maybe a little bit about the class that he's teaching over at Game Art Institute. And, um, and then he, uh, Alex really wanted to uh, talk to you guys about really this, this way to present your work. And uh, Alex is definitely one of the guys, I, I just love the way he kind of lays these things down, the way he presents it, the way he kind of gives these really cool edgy shots to everything. So this is going to be a great conversation to see how you can get yourself noticed because that's the hard thing today because there's just so many people getting into this industry and so many people are so good. So how do you get yourself noticed and, uh, and help people see you know, that you have what it takes? This would be a great conversation. And then Alex is going to break down and, and walk through what he did in his previous class and what you can kind of expect for his upcoming class. So we don't have a ton of time because he's actually home from lunch. Uh, we should get this thing going and get moving. So Alex, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, man. It's nice to be here. Yeah. All right. So give me a quick rundown. What, uh, what's your job? What do you do right now? So basically, I work at 343. 
uh, Industries working on the Halo franchise right now. I'm an environment artist, and I also concept and design pretty much everything that I make there. Uh, you know, I worked on Halo 5 and Halo 5 DLC. I'll just bring up some of that stuff and just show you. Um, but in my free time, I'm a concept designer, and that's, you know, that's really where a lot of my passion lies. Um, and yeah, so you know, it goes from making and designing assets like here for the end of the game. You know, I created and designed this area, yeah. figured it out, um, to just designing single one-off props and environments. And how much design uh, capacity do you have in the job when you're given this? I know it can vary, but what I'm getting at here is uh, you're an environment artist. That's the title. Uh, and But do you get these designs straight up? Are you, does, are you responsible for fleshing these out? So, I mean, it really, does, it really depends, right? Like this one, for example, I had some sketches, and there were elements of it that I kept, but for the most part. I designed a lot of it. Yeah. Um, whereas for the Forerunner architecture, I pretty much designed all of that from scratch. Uh, yeah, I, I think I've only ever had to use one concept uh, since I worked there. And I've designed a lot of other areas like the Guardian run that I don't have on here. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it really, yeah, it really depends on what job you're doing and whatever. But for the most part, I have a lot of creative freedom. You just have to stick with it style guides, kind of like any, you know, if you're working freelance or if you're working. Any other job, even if you get to design it, you still have to design within a certain amount of range, right? Yeah. That's great. So, okay, now, what does a day look like? You get into the job, um, let's imagine you start a new project. Uh, what are kind of some of the steps? What What's a day look like? Well, I mean, it's kind of like, depends on what, what you're working on, right? Like, what stage of production you're in, if you're in pre-production, if you're in the middle of production, if you're towards the end. So, you know, during different stages, you have you know, different tasks and different responsibilities. Some days you'll be, you know, creating like new art. Some days you'll be fixing bugs. Some days you'll be just trying to figure things out and come up with ideas, right? You know, it just, it really depends what part. Um, but it's not that different from the type of things like the concept stuff where, you know, you it, at the end of the day, you're going to be starting with like a block out and working your way to a final product, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's say um, you're in the middle of production. Yeah, so if you're in the middle of production, right, you're going to be showing up. There's probably a framework laid out where you laid out a framework for what you're going to be doing during the day or during that next few weeks. And you just start trying to figure out uh, how to keep going towards that end result. You know, So it could be from interacting with people and trying to figure out complex creative problems that require a lot of different people to just sitting down and figuring out how something's going to look and the design of it. Uh, it just very, it varies based on the task, right? Mm -hmm. And how much of your day is actually creating the work versus maybe meetings or things like that? Uh, I think it really depends on, like for me specifically, I usually spend a bit more time doing art. It depends on how much responsibility I have on a given task, right? Like on some tasks, you may have more responsibility, so you spend a lot more time talking to people where other ones you kind of just get to finally be in your bubble, you know, and actually start making stuff and designing right. things, which is when it's really fun, you know. But working with people can also be really enjoyable, so. Great. Okay, and then environment arts. It's, uh, you know, we have this environment artist boot camp over at GAI. And uh, in the ramp up to build this, one of the things that I discovered is that there's really just these two different categories. And even after we've run this now, there's this massive push to hard surface. And hard surface people are really, that's just, they're just hard surface. They're, you're not going to ask a hard surface guy to go out and do a tree, right? It's just, you know, they'll go buy it or something. So talk to me yeah. a little bit about the different types of jobs within environment arts. Because it's so, it's a huge umbrella. It just means like, hey, you make, you make the world. Well, what, what, the, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, so I mean, there, there's definitely different facets to it, and I think that you'll find that the most valuable artists are the ones who can be a little bit more flexible and not just be focused on one specific thing. Mm -hmm. But there's also something to be said for being a specialist at what you do, right? I think that while there are definitely, you know, people when they like when they're looking to hire people, they don't generally think in that those two terms, right? Like, well, are they a hard surface artist or are they an organics artist? And there's definitely a lot of people, though, that you'll find in the industry who have been in there a while or just are very, uh, 
good at general art rules and artistic theory, things like that, who can yeah. kind of bridge the gap. But generally, when you're trying to get in right, you want you want to be one or the other, and then develop the other skill later. Okay, so give it to me again in real simple terms. One or the other. You want to be what or what? Yeah, you want to be a hard surface artist, or yeah. you want to be an organics, uh, you know, more nature focused person, or just you know, organics such as creatures and characters. Or, but generally, in environment art, you know, there's those two. There's organics and hard surface. Okay, and so for for your your job is largely hard surface, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, 343, most of the environments are hard surface anyways, I imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah so, there's, a, there's a lot of both, but... Okay, so what do you guys look for in somebody who wants to be an environment ar artist there? What is it, and this is, I'm going to ask this maybe a little differently. Um, I, I want to drill down on this topic a little bit. So I'll just ask it, and then I'll, I'll ask a couple follow-up questions to see if I can get a, uh, a little deeper. But what do, what do um, people look for in portfolios and in work to know if somebody's capable of this job? So I think that's a, that's a really good question because I think the answer goes into a bit of what we wanted to talk about today. But I think yeah. it's really important that, you know, if you want to be a hard surface artist, for example, it's important that you can take a concept and not just look at exactly what's there. You know, if you look at exactly what's there, Generally, concepts are suggestions. They're, they're loose, and unless it's like a very specific line art, it's made to just imply a lot of stuff where the hard surface artist at the end of the day is going to be the one translating that concept into a full 3D environment, right? And so that's really important that you understand how you're going to translate that because a lot of people will just look at it and copy it one-to-one. -one. So knowing a little bit of design theory, you know, knowing how to extrapolate uh, shape language, how to extrapolate, you know, just based on other concepts you've seen and end up putting a piece together that takes the concept to the next level. Yeah. And I think it's also important, you know, the most crucial, most fundamental thing I think is making sure that you know how to do good props and then making good environments, right? Like I see a lot of people who start mm -hmm. out and they want to get a job and they just, they don't really focus on any one thing and they don't really get their fundamentals figured out, right? And so I think that's where a lot of people's portfolios will definitely begin to fall short, right? So in my experience and what I've found to be most helpful is a lot of students, when they first get into college or they start learning, they get really excited, right? And they want to just go and make all these crazy things like, oh man, I'm going to go make a game or I'm going to make this and that. So when you're trying to build your portfolio and if you want to get a job at 343 or another studio that has you know similar similar things hard surface focus on making good simple props and work your way up to environments right don't just go straight for one thing or the other because you need to be good at texturing you need to be good at baking you need to know how to high poly model and then bake it to a low poly you need to know how to UV and then when it goes to environments and when you're ready for that and you've understood those principles you know, knowing how to use tiling textures. And you want to be able to demonstrate that with your portfolio, all of these different things, and that you know the fundamentals at least and can show them in an image, right? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And for anybody who's listening, has anybody ran into that problem where they're like, I'm going to be an environment artist? <laughs> and then you, you run out there and you're like, oh, there's a lot of stuff in an environment. <laughs> and I'm seeing this in some of the students in the boot camp. It's like, you know, they, oh, I, I love, I'm going to create this beautiful environment with this big, massive scene, and there's going to be all these, like, parts in it. And then the, you know, completing it becomes, you know, a Herculean task because you've got a hundred different props that have to be kind of figured out or worked, and they all have to look good. So you start to suffer. And, it, and it's it, not, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not just that, too. It's not like it's just the work. Mm -hmm. The work becomes a Herculean effort because you don't, you, the way I see it is you should try and step out of your comfort zone yeah. and start small, right? And so yeah. when you just go straight into a huge task like that, but you don't have the fundamentals to back it up, you're going to struggle. Right. And it's going to be way harder than it is, and it probably won't turn out well. And so I think starting small is the most important because it allows you to iterate, fail, and experiment and learn and do a variety of things much faster that right. all tie into that end result of making an environment, right? Yeah. If you texture 10 small props before you go make one big environment, 
you're probably going to get a lot more experience out of those that'll help you when you're ready to make that environment. Yeah, great. That's a great point. All right. Um, so uh, one last point, one last question along there. Is there anything in somebody's work that kind of triggers you and says, okay, they know what they're talking about? Like if you were to say there's one or two things that you look at, um, like for example, do they have beveled edges, you know, which might indicate you know, their, their understanding about how to hit light and how to work with light or maybe their trim sheets or is there anything that on their work you, you look at it and you're like, okay, that guy is, is segueing to pro. I think that there's definitely a lot of things, but two two things that really matter to me. I mean, I could say design, and that's very broad, but yeah. if I were to be very specific, I find that in a lot of times with sci-fi, people don't see how sci-fi relates to the user and reality. You know, a lot of times there's, you know, what people will call it generic, right? Like something is generic. Hmm. And they'll do a lot of things like 45 degree angles on everything. They'll just have random insets and boxes and and shapes that aren't really believable or interesting. It's just like they add emissives everywhere. They don't know how to really think about sci-fi in the context of the real world, right? Like that's something that I think you should always push away from and think and look at stuff that if you were to walk into a room, right? How would you actually interact with it? How would the things in that room function? And so when you just start saying to yourself, well, I just want to put this random stuff everywhere and you catch yourself doing that, people who can think about it in a different context, it'll show in the work, right? You know, if people put lights where lights would be needed or they put in a missive somewhere because it has a specific function to tell the user, oh, this emissive is telling me the status of something or that something's on or off, et cetera, rather than I'm just going to cover door frames with glowing light strips because it's cool. Yes. Um, <laughs> or just, you know, oh, I have polygons. I'm going to inset every polygon and push it in and call it a detail like that. You need to take it a step farther than that. And then, um, yeah, and then just showing that you can take what's in the concept and take it to the next level, right? Because if you can't take it to the next level, then it means that you can't actually reach the level. You probably will just reach the level of the concept or under it. And then if you had to do, say, let's say someone said, hey, can you make a level based on this concept? Yeah. Could you actually do that? And so those are two things that I think are super important. Um, there's obviously a lot more that goes into it than that. But those two things, you know, pushing away from making things generic and trying to figure out how they actually function in the real yeah. world, yeah. but applying that sci-fi flavor, right? Yeah. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. All right, let's get in and then um, let's start talking about the meat of what we wanted to talk about today, um, how you present your work, and that'll leave us a little bit of time, I think, at the end. So um, this is all new to me uh, in terms of your presentation, and, and I'm really excited about that because, like I said, I, you know, you always have like that next level to your stuff. Um, like, for example, one of the guns you did in class, it turned into like an ad for water, if I remember right. Oh, that that's... That's a little bit more deep than that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, th I thought, what? That's pretty awesome, you know? And it adds this, like, it's like, did he really do that for this, you know? And so I started to wonder. So t talk to us about, like, how you think about presenting your work. And let's be clear here, guys. The idea, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, the idea is uh, kind of how to get your work noticed, not because it's a big ego trip, but it's how do you get your work noticed because we're really trying to get a job, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, a lot of people, when they think, like, oh, you know, this guy is trying to market himself or, you know, he wants uh, to get attention. Like, I think that's a really narrow way to look at it. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, how you present your work and your work gives you freedom in life. I mean, it's one thing to enjoy art and we all enjoy art, but we also want to have a job doing it. Right. And so I think it's really important to, to keep that in mind that how you present your work is so important because the people looking at it, are going to, they're going to be judging it through their own filter and making sure that you maximize the effectiveness of the work that you do and getting as much out of it to help you have that freedom and to help you get the jobs you want, I think is super important. You know, why would you put all that work into an environment or to into a gun or into a mech or into something, but then shortchange yourself at the end? You know, you already did the fun part. Why would you not try and take it to the next level or make it easier for yourself, right? So I think that's something that is really important because... 
It's a great point. Your portfolio and, is a marketing strategy. It is a, it's a way to sell yourself to someone. If someone looks at your portfolio and they don't want to hire you, then you need to learn how to make them want to. You know, it's not like they just look at it and they're going to want to hire you right away. You need right. to you need to show them why. That's great. So how do we do that? Well, I think that there's a few different things you can lean on besides what I'm going to talk into. I think there's two basic ways, especially for 3D art. One of them is technical skill, right? Everybody looks at something that's detailed or complex and they say, that's crazy. That's really good technical skill. People are impressed by that. And then they're also impressed by uh, artistic skill, right? So it's really important that you think about how you can leverage these two things. Like when it comes to design theory, which I talk a lot about in the class, and I just really like talking about design theory to me is one of those ways. It's a way to make the equivalent of like a pop song, right? Like when you think about music, there's music that's very specific and weird. And then there's also like music that is composed well and is interesting. But then there's also pop songs and things that are kind of catchy, right? And I think that in art, it's the same way. Like understanding art rules and art theory is a way to kind of make things catchy or that people will generally find pleasing. And then your technical skill added on to that or your style is kind of the ways that you can look at uh, leveraging yourself. Right. You know, you should always look at how you can use those those tools. But um, yeah, so I wanted to just kind of talk about a little bit how I structure my posts yeah. and why. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about the most. And then also how I use Keyshot and I kind of plan out my work when I get to that end stage, right? It's one thing to make the work but it's another one to, to package it all together and show that work. So that's kind of what I was hoping to talk about today. Let's do that. And let's, and let's also talk about timeline. So um, you mentioned in the conversation that you start thinking about how to post work, not at the end when you're finished, but as you're getting finished. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I think it's really important because when you, when you think about like, you know, I've learned this through a lot of mistakes and I've learned a lot of things as you finish product projects, this is where you really get to that part where you either shortchange yourself on the work you did mm -hmm. or you maximize the effectiveness at, uh, of it at the end. And I think it's really important before you start presenting that you think about your strategy to present it because when you make something, right, you probably put a lot of work and a lot of effort into it. And you put, you know, you made different materials, you made maybe node graphs if you're doing environments for your shaders. You made high polys, you made low polys, you made textured assets, you designed something. There's a lot of different things that go into it. And when someone's looking at your work, the more that they understand what you did, the better. So that's kind of why I want to talk about this, because I feel a lot of people, and I've seen a lot of people, even in the industry, who will do some amazing, amazing work. And then when they go to show it to other people or put it in their portfolio, it falls flat. And they don't even showcase the amazing work that they did. Hmm. All right. So how, what's, the, what's the first step? So uh, also, we have a question, I believe. We've got lots of questions. Um, but okay. where, where are you seeing them? Uh, in GoToMeeting? Doing... All right. We'll do questions at the end? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to break down kind of at least this, uh, this gun that I made because I think that this is probably the best example. So this gun, for example, I put a lot of extra work and a lot of extra time into the internals, into making it break apart, uh, into making it, trying to, at least attempting to make it feel believable, right? And so it's really important that, like, I could just show two shots, but that doesn't actually show all the work I did, right? Like, there's so much more detail, there's so much extra things. And so the way that I structure my posts is very important. Like, for example, when you have the main shot, you want to tell someone the overall idea. You want them to look at it and be like, okay, I get it. And then the next one was intentionally, I want them to see the scope of the work that I did. So now they're interested to keep looking, right? They're, they're, it's caught their attention that I did all this extra work. And then so I begin to start showing things in like a matter of importance. Like you think about when you make something, what order of importance are the images and the camera angles communicating to the viewer, right? If the first image I did was some camo one and it was open like this, it's not really gonna be selling that idea too well. So I believe it's super important that you kind of 
like I said, break it down in order of hierarchy. And if someone is looking at it, think about it through their eyes. What are they going to want to know first? They're going to want to know the overall idea. Secondly, you want to showcase to them in their face the, the amount of work that you did. And then you want to just start going down lower and lower in the priority of importance. Right. And then, yeah, like, for example, I like to break my stuff into two posts because I find a lot of times, like, I'll see people who will do a art dump and they'll put everything in one post and then nobody will even see half of the work that they did. So I always find it's important to do the exact same thing, right? Like, we start with this shot that shows the most important detailed area and we start breaking it down lower and lower and then we get into the more just fun stuff that doesn't necessarily sell the idea but it's enjoyable right yeah can you go back to the top one and let me uh, take a look at that I want to understand what are the distinctions again uh, so what makes this the important one uh, as opposed oh. to those side views where things are you know it looks like somebody's following concept art so I might think that would be more important well, I mean, it depends on what you want to show, right? So you, that's something you have to ask yourself. What did you put the most time into? What matters the most to you that you communicate to someone, right? Like, yeah. if I were to put this image at the bottom, but I spent most of my time here, why would I, like, why would I do that? Why would I, why would I not make a separate post to show off something that I think is important in this image? So you kind of have to ask yourself what it's communicating the viewer, but also what, what work you put into it. Like for example, an orthographic shot like this isn't really gonna help someone understand the idea where a three quarters view like this and it's a close up shows all the extra effort put into it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like a shot like this, it doesn't really show any more of the idea either. It's just for fun, right? And the orthographic one, I kind of personally, I just structure my posts a little bit differently. So I like to have like the close ups and then I find that most people, if they were to see the orthographic first, I don't think that they would care as much because people are usually imp impressed by a clean design render, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, that's so, exactly what I was thinking. But at the same time, if somebody's starting out, they it, you know, they might be forgiven for thinking, hey, the job is match, you know, these concept orthogonal drawings that, you know, somebody gave you. So I'll post those first, but they're not sexy. So is the job exactly. to be sexy? Is the job to, you know, show off skill or technical or what? How, what's the variable there? I mean, I think that it's, it's a bit of both, right? Like if an image, like you could have the coolest idea in the world, but if you don't present it in a sexy way or a cool way, no one's really going to care. Like I've seen sure. so much art where you're like, this is an amazing model, yeah. but it's not presented well, it's not lit well, it's not going to catch someone's eye. Right. And so it's just kind of almost like wasted work in a degree to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's just very important to think like, what is my best shot? and be very aware of like what you're communicating to the viewer. You know, this one, if an employer looks at this, at least if I were looking at it, I would say, you know, there's a lot of detail, you know. I don't yeah. want to say anything that sounds kind of like uh, fully yourself or whatever, but like, you know, there's a lot of detail, right? There's a lot of modeling put in it. There's complicated shapes. There's shapes that are a little bit more difficult to model. And so they would say, okay, well, I get it now. Like, there's all this extra work that was put into it. It's a little more complex than usual. And so hopefully that would tell them, like, this person could model something complex, right? Yeah. In fact, if you don't mind, let's let's look at that image. And I want you to walk me through. I know, you know, it might be hard to be objective, but that's actually good. So tell me, like, what are the things in here that specifically communicate, um, you know, that you've got? Uh, a sense of design that you can model like if somebody was looking at this and they were trying to say how the heck can I be like Alex and show this work off right they might just go in and, the, and it is a whole bunch of time to try to, to try to model you know whatever's there but what are like three things in this image that really communicate you know that you know what you're doing from your perspective I think that it's really important when you're doing hard surface and you know I think it's debatable. You can have good design that isn't complex. That's absolutely 100% true in yeah. every way. But when you want to impress people with modeling, yeah. learn how to break the box. You know, if you make shapes that are harder to model yeah. and they're not just a primitive with some bevels on it or just straight out of a 3D package, right? Yeah. The more that you can break that, the more you break someone's illusion of understanding how to model it. You know, it's just like in painting, right? They say you don't want to see all the brush strokes or you don't want to know what brush someone used. You don't want to know how they got to the end result. When you're modeling, I think it's very important to always try and break that, break the box. You want someone to look at this and be like, I don't know how you modeled it. 
I'm yes. not saying everything has to be like that, but if you want to impress people on a technical level, push your skill, push your ability to model complicated things and give yourself more artistic freedom. Yeah. That's the way to do it, you know. Try so, and So what in this that. image represents that for you? I mean, I think that there's a bit of things like for example, this piece is all one piece. There's no real clear primitive in mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff, right? Yeah. There are some simple things that are intentionally simple. Yeah. But for example, uh, this piece, if I had it in 3D, it'd be easier to explain. But yeah, like this piece, for example, it's not any type of primitive shape, right? We have a circular piece that integrates and flows into this more triangular piece. Yeah. And then it flows forward and, you know, just breaking the box in subtle ways, cutting up shapes, et cetera. Um, the more that you can explain how things communicate like for example echoing this curve here to reinforce the circular element yeah things, just little things like that to help break the box and push the complexity that's great okay so in terms of that um the top part of that it's really looking at how there's a cylinder kind of in the middle or you know yeah on the side and then the way in which that it's not a full cylinder because it kind of flattens off on a little side, but then it integrates with a more complex piece of uh, geometry. And so you're really looking to see how people manage the, this complexity, which is going to absolutely be part of the job. You know, it's not just cylinders bullying in together, but, you know, yeah, yeah that kind of absolutely. complex flow. Absolutely. I, I like to call it basically compound forms, right? Nice. Yes. Taking two forms merging them together in a pleasing way and learning how to transition those forms into one another. And I think that's something that a lot of 3D artists, by the nature of the complexity of polymodeling, struggle with, you know? And so the more that you push yourself out of that, the more artistic freedom you'll have and the more com complicated things you can do, right? Yep. So I think it's really important to focus on compound forms in the, in the area of 3D. Right. Especially. Yeah, that's a great, that, and that's a great example. All right, so what's next? So um, you've got the imagery, you've got these breakdowns. What's the next thing that's on your mind? So basically, I just kind of want to show how I set up my posts because it's more than just also setting up your posts beforehand is more than just communicating to the viewer. Um, it's more than that. It's also sure. something for you, right? Like when you break down and you look at the scope of your project, how are you going to present that project? And so you can have all of these ideas, you can set up all these camera shots, but you might not know how many camera shots you want. What shots are good? Do I have too many of the same shot? How much work is actually left on this project? And it's really important as you get closer to finishing and you enter this stage of needing to present your work. While it's subtle, I think it's incredibly important that you try and think this out and plan it out. So what I often do is, I'm just gonna go through it really quick. Basically, I have my object in here, right? And this and, is uh, the sorry, guy sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what program are you in, just so people know? So I'm in Keyshot right now. Yeah. Uh, and I modeled this gun in Max during the last class, and so I cover basically this whole topic in the class. But yeah, so I try and plan this stuff out actually before in Max. Like for example, I did do things like I have uh, missile hatches yeah. that shoot out here. And so this is going to be important when we talk about presenting it because that's an important key feature of something I made. So I need to make sure I showcase that, right? And I want to plan that I showcase it well. So let me uh, show that here because I will hide and unhide different pieces. All right. For those, uh, for anybody, if you've got questions, we're going to open this up for Q&A in a little bit. But feel free to keep posting them, and I'll see if I can't pass them through. Uh, so, for example, Aureen is asking, how important are wireframe breakdowns in presenting your work? Uh, I think it really depends. Uh, if you're going for a game art position, as long as you have a good wireframe and it's not like, if your wireframe for your low poly, and we're talking about game art, if yep. your wireframe for your low poly is bad, I would say not present it. But if it looks good, I would just present the model, right? Uh, which actually brings me to another thing I kind of wanted to mention about all of this. When you, like for example, let's say you make a game asset, right? Yep. You're going to be generating three models. You're going to be making a low poly and a high poly. You're going to be texturing. And there's, a, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. But if you only show, for example, 
the low poly and you only show the bake, then you're actually leaving out a potential extra piece that you could have to show it off. Like let's say you make a car and you only show the low poly, but if you did a really cool high poly render, you'd be getting basically free, free mileage, free images, free extra stuff out of the work that you're doing. And so it's very important not to, to squander all of that effort you put into it and to try and maximize the, uh, the impact of your, your, your model. Uh, when it comes to wireframes, I think it's very important if it's very clean, you know, learn how to make clean low polys. And if it's really good and someone looks at it and they won't have any objections really, then definitely show it. Uh, it'll show technical understanding. And that's really, what I think a lot of studios look for, but mm. you have to make sure that you're not hurting yourself by showing a lack of technical understanding. Got it. So if your uh, wireframe sucks, don't show it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got but it. If the model's good, then it's fine. So <laughs> yeah. we'll work towards getting a good wireframe at the end of the like, That's the goal. Yeah, and you know, uh, to just sidetrack down here on this a little bit, um, a, a lot of people, and I, you know, we encounter a lot of students, um, they want to be perfect at topology and they want all of, they would, they would want to have a perfect wireframe before they might even apply for the job. Uh, and how valuable do you think it is? How much on the job learning is acceptable, you know, versus normal, you know, like my, my wife is a great example of how you can kind of push this cause she can talk herself into any situation and uh, she's an architect. So she trained for years and her first job, they're like, do you know, um, uh, I think it was Revit or something like that. And she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. She goes home. She doesn't know Revit. <laughs> so <laughs> she spends all night learning Revit. And if anybody's tried to learn Revit, you don't learn it overnight. <laughs> and, but she pulled an all-nighter. She came in the next day and she knew at least how to move the mouse around, right? So uh, that's kind of the extreme case. But, like, you know, how how much does somebody need to learn and how much is, you know, what's acceptable to just kind of get by with while you grow? Because we're all growing. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'll be honest, when I started my first jobs, I had no idea what I was doing for a, for a little bit, right? Like it's really stressful and it's hard and you have to ramp up and there's a ton of stuff that I feel like isn't taught very much. And so you kind of do have to figure and learn stuff from other people once you get a job. But I think it's very important that you, like I said before, you know how to bake, you know how to make a low poly consistently and quickly. It doesn't have to be a million percent perfect, but don't be wasteful. You know, don't be putting stuff where it doesn't matter. You have to at least be proficient in it enough that if someone said to you, hey, can you make this prop on your first day or your first week, that you could at least do it and it would look good enough and it would be technically acceptable. So that's why I say get your fundamentals down when you want to apply for a job. You got to know how to high poly. You don't have to be the best high poly modeler, but don't make, you know, don't have a lot of pinching, don't have, you know, super messy topology and make it easy to work with. Same thing with your low poly, you know, know how to bake consistently. If you don't know how to bake consistently, no one's going to have you bake or you're going to sit there struggling. Uh, and then they'll have to, they'll, they'll catch on, right? Or it'll be stressful and not, not everybody expects, you to be perfect all the time. You know, sometimes they hire people right out of college, but if you want to be sure that it's not going to be a nightmare, because for me personally, when I started, it was very stressful and I had to learn a lot. And I think that if I had to go back, I would have learned how to be better at a lot of those fundamentals, right? You know, being consistently good at texturing, being consistently good at making low polys, being consistently good at making high polys. So anyway, those are the things that I think are very important and a lot Great. of people don't really focus on as specifics. Great, that makes a lot of sense. All right, I interrupted you. That's all good. Um, yeah, so we're over here. I just want to talk about how, in the context of this gun, hosting may not seem like a super crazy important thing. It may not even seem like it's hard or that there's much substance to how you order stuff and why. But while it is a subtle thing, I think it's a subtle thing that you should be aware of and learn how to use to your advantage, right? So let's just talk about it from the very beginning. When I'm making this thing, I ask myself, you know, what are the features that I want in this gun? What are the things that are important to me? You know, so there's different things. Like, for example, I wanted these missiles to fire. So you should immediately know, right, this is something I need to showcase, and I need to showcase it well. 
and it's a good chance for you to make mistakes and learn from them. But anyway, let's talk about creating a post. So basically, when I'm creating a post, I always start with thinking about how am I going to show this and how am I going to put it up. So I go into Keyshot and we have these cameras, right? And we want to go and basically start, just start figuring out the best camera angles. And we're going to start blocking out our post. There's two reasons to do this. One is it allows us to evaluate how well we're communicating the image before we start spending time on it, before we start lighting it, rendering it, et cetera. And then it also allows us to visualize and see how much work we have left to do. And I found that it's helped me a lot. So like I say, it's a subtle thing, but I found that it's extremely helpful for me at least. So with this one, I'm just gonna start out with a basic camera angle. And we're just gonna call this uh, like main shot, shot A. And we're just gonna do a simple screenshot. And we're going to go into uh, ArtStation or CG Society, anywhere you really want to upload and showcase your work. And we're just going to start putting these in here. It's not a super exciting process, but I assure you it will make your life a lot easier. For anybody who's watching this uh, on social media, Twitch or Facebook, um, I'll upload the recording of this later so it'll be a higher quality stream for you. Or higher quality than the stream. Here a sec. Got to find where that save to. It doesn't really matter how you want to get the images. It just matters that you start getting stuff up there and you start blocking out your posts. So I'm actually going to use some of my screenshots from before. I have like about a thousand screenshots in this folder. So let me. Let me get them up in here really quick. All right, so we're just going to start blocking our posts. We have this first one uploading. And basically what we're going to do while we're working on this is be evaluating and checking out how our design is going to be sold. So we want to showcase all the different parts. So the first post I always do the most like the main shots, not the detail shots, the ones that just show the broad idea. So let me go and uh, create another camera. And this one, we already have the front view. So let's go and let's get the side or back view. Rear view. One. And so we go and we find an angle. And you don't have to worry about lighting it nice at this point or anything like that. Just think about what you're showing with this thing, right? You know, the front, the back, really basic stuff like that. It's not anything super crazy, but it's about being able to evaluate it as you work on it. And then we'll go into a little bit more about like thumbnails, how to catch people's eye with things, et cetera. Let's get into uploading the second one. Is that the model you made in class? Yeah, this is the model I made in class. I can go, I can show the whole Max file in a second if you'd like. Yeah, I'll post it here uh, for you guys a link so that you can see the class. That way, if you have any questions, uh, you'll be able to get those answered while we're doing this. So I'm gonna, let me, all right, I found what I need. All right, so, sec. So we're going to get that rear shot in here. And for some reason, there we go. All right, so we're going to get the rear shot. And I'm just going to copy and paste these a little bit. But basically, the idea is we create all of our views, right? And then we upload them. It just as screenshots, we don't have to worry about final renders. We don't have to worry about them looking nice. We just have to know what these angles are going to communicate to the viewer. And so what I like to do is I like to preview them before I actually look at them. So we have to name this with this crop down. So one of the cool features and the crux of basically this is we can um, preview on community page and you can start to see what your post is gonna look like as we work on it, right? And it just allows you to kind of evaluate 
and tell how it's going to be in the end. And when someone's looking at it, you can do all the things I was saying, like, what order am I going to present these? Are there too many images that are similar? These are all very important questions that may seem very basic, but it's really easy to, to not do that, right? And to, to put too many duplicates or to not order them in such a way that you're really maximizing the work that you did. So for this particular thing, I want to be able to show both sides of the gun because it's asymmetric. So that's what I'm going to upload next. I want to also be able to show the fact that there's missiles firing. I want to show the front of the gun because that's where the most of the functionality is, right? Like there's the plate that uh, compresses the energy before it releases. There's the eye, which is the emitter source. There's the uh, missiles, and then there's the overall design idea I had behind it, which was having scales and making it feel like a crocodile. Uh, so those are the things that I really want to show first. It's just the overall idea. And then you want to show things in order of hierarchy, like what's most important. Is and knowing there, your camera. Yeah. Is asymmetry a really important kind of selling point? I think it can be, right? I mean, you if you've spent the time to model the other side of something, why wouldn't you want to show that? Totally, yeah. But is it worth it to model the other side? Or or does it, or is there no, like, what's the benefit to doing that? Well, I mean, this model, for example, is asymmetric because I didn't want to make it symmetric. Mm -hmm. So there's a benefit to showing it if you decide to make your design asymmetric. Yep. I think that making things asymmetric in 3D is a good way to also break that, that 3D illusion, right? Because right. it's so easy to just hit symmetry yep. and your model's done. So there's definitely like tricks you can do on the topic of symmetry. Like for example, the way that I model is most of the gun is symmetric, but I model it in such a way that I can introduce asymmetry without adding a lot of extra work. So I only have like maybe two or three parts that are asymmetric and the rest of it's symmetrical. Cool. So I'm just gonna upload one more for this post. Like I said, it doesn't seem like something that is super crazy, but I promise you, it, it makes things a lot easier in the end. Like for example, I realized during this that I had an image of a top view, right? Yeah. And I also want to have an image of the back view, and then I have this image. So let's, let's just take a look at this on community really quick. And you'll notice that we have this image. And then if we keep scrolling down, oh, let me refresh that, didn't show up. If we keep scrolling down, let me refresh this again, sorry. Yeah, so if we keep scrolling down right, we have this angle that's similar. And then we have this one. So you kind of have to ask yourself, is it important to have both of these angles? You know, just because you have a lot of images doesn't mean you should have them. You should think about the quality of them and not trying to just fill space, right? Like this one is an important image because it shows the front and it shows the top and the back. And so in the blockout stage, I've already decided that this is going to be an image. It's not just going to be a render. It's not just going to be one angle. So I think that's really important. Um, yeah. So basically what I've done here, and it may seem simple, is I've been able to evaluate you know, how my angles are working as a holistic thing rather than just saying, oh, I have all these different angles and key shot, and then eventually I'm just going to upload them, and not really thinking about how they all communicate together and how the end result is going to look on a page, right? Yeah. So all I've right. been able to kind of, yeah, critique myself and get to a better place. Great, great. All right, so how much more time do we have, uh, excuse me, on your schedule? Uh, I can go another 15 minutes. Okay, so why don't we, uh, let's open this up for questions on presentation. I'll take a couple minutes on questions, guys. And uh, and I'll be looking at all the places. I'm going to look at Twitch. I'm going to look at Facebook, um, YouTube, and then uh, go to webinar. But I'm going to prioritize go to webinar because they're the guys who are here with us live. And, um, and you know, that's just, that's where I am most of the time. So, so uh, yeah, go for it. Before, uh, before we go to that, I just want to talk about one last thing that I think is super important is thumbnails. Yes. Thumbnails may seem like a very subtle thing, but it's it's actually the most important, right? Like, that's what gets someone to look at your image in the first place. Mm -hmm. Why are they going to click your picture? What's going to attract their eye? So I find that there's a few different rules that you can basically apply to. One of them is when you're creating a thumbnail, I personally like to stick with the rule of thirds. 
I like to also make sure that the image I have is exciting and high contrast and oftentimes showing something that's very readable. If you have like a mech and you're zoomed all the way out and you just see like this body with some details and it's not very strong, yeah. people are less likely to click on it, right? So I think it's really important that you pick one of your strongest images and you want to put that as a thumbnail, but don't put it first because then someone will just get that instant gratification, right? Like you want them to go mm. searching through the images for the ones that that are interesting to them. So for example, on this one, I have this white one that's the exposed version, but I don't make it my first image for exactly that reason, because someone clicked it because they want to see that. But if they don't see it right away, they're going to want to look for it. So making sure you catch the eye, making sure you put an image that is striking and makes people want to look at the rest of your images is super important. You know, follow rule of thirds, make sure it's readable. It's the same thing on Instagram. The more readable something is, when you're looking at it nice and tiny, the more someone's going to be able to understand it. Got it. Uh, you just blinked yeah, out a little bit. Questions we can also talk about. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Uh, can you see my screen still? Yeah, can still see it. All right, guys, start uh, shouting out your questions. Remember, go to webinar, guys. I'm prioritizing you. Uh, Alina, in making an environment art, I'm making an environment art portfolio right now. Should I focus more on small, impressive models or one big, complex team? I think that if you focus, it depends on where your skill set is. I think that's the most important thing. Be mindful of where you're at. If you ask yourself the questions like, can I bake consistently? Can I texture consistently and it looks industry standard? Can I do a low poly and I'm not struggling? all the time? Can I do a high poly and it looks good? Those are the questions you should ask yourself. And I feel like if you can't answer those with a yes, uh, I would focus on that first. If you can be good at making very good, simple props, you'll be able to apply that to a larger environment, right? So you don't want to, if you're still starting out, jump right into that. Got it. Okay, and Joseph, a uh, question about image hierarchy. Would it be similar to a character artist compared to an environment artist? So he's just wondering if what you're saying translates to character artists too. I think it translates to anything, really. I mean, you always want to look at what's the main idea, what's the second most important thing you're trying to tell someone, right? So if you're selling a product or a character, you want someone to know what that's about. You want to know how it works. You want, to, you want them to be able to visually understand the basic idea behind it, and then start showing specifics or close-ups, things that are a bit more detail-oriented, but not the big picture, right? Like you want to go big picture to smaller importance. I think okay. that could be for anything. Okay, uh, on Facebook, uh, Xander's asking about what sites should I make my portfolio on other than my own? Personally, and this is just me, I don't even have a website at the moment. Um, not that you shouldn't. I think ArtStation, CG Society, Instagram, Facebook. Some people love Twitter. I don't even understand how Twitter works. You and I but <laughs> Dude, that, that site is so confusing and I don't understand. But I think Instagram is really great. Instagram is a really great way to reach a ton of people and be a little bit more casual. There's so many people at your fingertips with Instagram. Um, I think that Facebook especially is great. Beyond your profile, you know, there's the group 10,000 hours, right? Uh, if you post on 10,000 hours, there's 80,000 people right there, or 60, right there who could see your work. That's insane amount of people and a insane amount of people you can reach nearly instantly. So my strategy is generally when I post, I create my art station and CG Society links mm -hmm. and then I post it on Instagram, and then I share all of that on 10,000 hours. I try and make sure that I'm driving clicks to my portfolio to maximize the amount of you know viewership I'm going to get out of it. Yeah. So the more people, like you know, you never know who's going to be there, right? It could be someone who's looking to hire a weapons artist or a character artist, and they see it and they're like, oh, we got to hire this guy, right? So don't don't shortchange yourself. Um, also, poly count, if you do game art, is great. 
you know, post in the Weibo threads, you know, what are you working on threads, et cetera, with links to, to your art station so they can see more. Um, yeah, post everywhere. Okay, uh, Tatsuya is asking, if I'm not into lighting and rendering yet, but I want to present my sculpt, how, what's the best way to do it? I would just say, find the most pleasing way to do it. You know, if it's a really nice matte cap with some Photoshop editing, always put that extra work into your presentation. You know, going into Photoshop isn't lying. I think a lot of people have this kind of this kind of idea that doing posts isn't is bad. So I would try and break that and I would just go into Photoshop, you know, maybe touch it up a bit. Do your best to just make it interesting, right? Like you, not everything needs to be some fancy render. As long as it looks good, someone's gonna be happy. So don't do a Maya viewport render with blue wire frame ever with a Lambert shader. Like, as long as it looks cool, like this is a viewport render, right? Like I like to present viewport renders because they're interesting. Anybody can do that. So I wouldn't say that you need to know how to light to be good at presenting. Great. Okay, let me see cool. if, yeah, take a free lesson. Okay, great. All right, we got a couple questions to go to webinar. Um, Alexander, where did I lost it? Omar, what is your opinion the most efficient way to grow as an artist? Do you prefer making quick studies or taking complex projects, complete projects? So I have a lot of opinions on this, and I think you'll find that different people will have different opinions. Basically, the way I see it is there's room for everything, and everything has a purpose, right? Like sometimes doing quick, small projects is incredibly important to get that experience to fail fast. But I also feel at the same time, large complex projects can offer you similar benefits. So for example, I always like to say, and I, I've said this on Facebook and some people like to fight about it, but I also like to think that whole things work. Anyway, I'm rambling. If you push on quality over quantity, eventually quality and quantity will happen at the same time. Like quality over quantity leads to quality and quantity. Because if you say, make a shape like this, and this was hard for you at one point, if you do two shapes like this or three shapes like this, and it took you a while, eventually something like this will be very easy. Like this, this wasn't really that challenging for me to make. It might have been challenging for me to design, but it's because I've done a lot of other shapes that were very hard for me. So take the time to get stuff right first in my opinion. If it's not right and you just say, oh, well, I gotta be fast, and so you make something bad, what's the point? You know, if you know that you can push it further, do it. You know, obviously if you have, cons if you have deadlines, things like that, that's different. But if you wanna like really push yourself, take the time to make something as best to your ability. And then at the same time, right, like a quick study is also just as important, you know? There's things like figure drawing. Figure drawing is explicitly a quick thing because it makes you better at making decisions fast. So there's there's a place for everything, I think. But I would say if you're just starting out and you're making props, take the time to make the prop look good instead of just trying to be fast. Great. So. Okay. One last question here. Then um, any uh, common mistakes that people make, beginners make, kind of posting and um, trying to get noticed. Well, there's a lot of very simple ones, like I had said before. Mm -hmm. Don't just take a Maya viewport render with blue wireframe and a Lambert. Um, there's also people that do like weird things, like they'll overlay wireframes on their renders as their main images. There's people who will just leave things that are kind of unsightly, very close to the camera. Mm -hmm. I think it's just really important to try and make sure that, like I say about breaking the box and going the extra step, do the same thing with your presentation, right? Like try and just push it away. Like don't open Keyshot, apply all the default materials and call it done. Like try and push it to the next level, add that extra 10%. Look to see where you can find that extra 10%. Awesome, all right, cool. So uh, we got just like a couple more minutes. Do you wanna walk us through the class and some of the, the work that you did for that? Yeah, so in the last class, we... Uh, and in fact, we, um, sorry, let me get yeah. you to, Do you mind popping into a browser real quick and going to Game Art Institute? Sure. Since we're sharing your screen. Um, and then I'll show everybody how you get to it. So if you go to Game Art Institute, excuse me, you should be able to just scroll down, and you'll see the next row will be live classes. Uh, and there you go. 
so you're in courses, the second row. It kind of went pretty fast, uh, but you can see, uh, learn the art of hard surface design. Um, if you go in there real quick, Alex, I'll show them one more thing. Um, if you go into the middle of the page, guys, you'll see somewhere where it says take a free lesson right there. That's going to give you uh, three different lessons from Alex that are excerpts from his previous class. It'll really give you a sense of how the class runs. So if you're interested, make sure you scroll down to the bottom of, or to the middle of the page. You enter your email and your name in there, and you'll be taken immediately to three pretty awesome lessons on how he breaks down form. All right. So just to kind of talk about how I approach the classes, going to talk also about how I approach really anything that I make. So what we did in the last class is I really wanted to talk a lot about design for to start with, you know, design vocabulary, design principles, just artistic principles in general, you know, we've got balance, form, talking about what form is, talking about 70-30, hierarchy, you know, avoiding evenness, uh, repetition, all sorts of things. I mean, there's a lot, and I could honestly talk about it for an eternity because it's exciting to me. But basically what we do in the class is we start out with something that looks like this, just a really basic block out. And we refine this idea more and more until we start to reach a more complicated stage. So I'll bring up a few progress images to show how we got there. In each class, we would just detail it up a bit more, start figuring out stuff from big to small a little bit more. So let me bring up another one. And then eventually we make our first step, right? We start high poly modeling. And in the class, you know, I go over the actual design, I talk about every single design choice I'm making and why as I'm doing it in real time. You know, there's there's reasons for why you want to do certain things. And so I like to explain how that works. The choices that I'm making, you know, for example, echoing all three of these dark insets and then having line work that connects them, echoing these curves here, uh, echoing the grip designs, which are also poly modeled things like this that are super important and trying to guide you through it. Because one thing that I find super, super frustrating for people trying to learn design is they're always like, well, what book should I read? Uh, you know, what, what should I, like, where should I learn it? And I find that it's best to, to learn it through critique and watching someone do it and explaining how it's used. You know, if you read a book, they're not going to say, oh, this is how it's used. They might, but it's still hard to grasp and it probably doesn't fit the circumstances that you're trying to apply it to, right? Like if someone says, here's how you avoid evenness in forms, you might not know how that applies to hard surface. So I like to talk a lot about how all of these things kind of go together and how you can apply these different uh, artistic rules to your hard surface designs. And then I also go over the high poly modeling uh, phase, right? Like, so basically how I start everything out is I start with a low poly, it's super rough, keeping things planar, you know, making sure I have a good foundation to work on. And then from there, I begin to start detailing it and going deeper and refining it and figuring out the function, figuring things out until I have a really good foundation to begin mid poly on. And I like to stay mid poly until the very end. So that way I can make changes and add detail without wasting time or compromising anything else because the choice is already made. So just showing a little bit of the progress throughout the class. Are there any questions on the class? Yeah, start asking. Okay. If you guys got any questions, let me know. Uh, I'll start gathering those. Um, and I remember there was a period in which this class, um, so walk us through in the beginning uh, they're going to be designing their own model or their own prop, or are you going to have something for them, or are they going to take from concept? Like, where do they start? So, essentially, I believe that kind of what you want to get out of the class, you can get out of it, whether it's design or modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I go over both of those in detail, right? I go in depth about how to model edge flow, um, you know, how to lay proper topology, how to control your edges, what good edge thickness is, um, working in mid poly, how to do a proper block out, when it's too early to start adding bevels. I also talk about design theory. So if a student wants to just do something from a concept and learn how to apply design theory to make the concept better and improve their modeling, they can do that, right? 
if they want to go and make a weapon or a prop and design it and model it, they can do that. If they just want to do design stuff and just concept it, they can do that. You know, we had a we had a concept artist in our last class, and he just did 2D sketches with some Maya blockouts. So it just really depends what you want to get out of it. Got it. And uh, Jay Swan is, on YouTube is asking, you know, these models seem quite high res. Um, is it too high res? How does this work, and how does it get translated into games? So the models that I'm making are not necessarily game res. Yep. Like, they are high res. Um, if this were to be game res, I would bake it down. Yep. Um, You'd these still models, do the high res. Yeah, you would still do the high res. I mean, there's really no difference. The only difference is, not to get too technical, how you approach the high poly. When yep. you're making stuff for games, the high poly tends to be more simplified yep. or representative of your low poly's final topology, which is a completely different topic. But Essentially, if you're making something for a game, you make a high poly like this, and then you bake it down to a low poly model with a normal map. Okay, great. All right, good. Looks like most people are getting access to that link. Uh, and then we go from there. And uh, Benissa is asking, uh, does he do the high res in Maya or Fusion? So this is all a 3ds Max poly modeled in sub D. Great. Okay, and that's what's demonstrated in the class. So here's the yep. deal, guys. Um, you see that there's this long kind of um, mid-poly process that he goes through, and it was really fascinating to watch that in the class. You're going to see this whole development cycle of how you go through and you do this, and it's really a, a fantastic education in how to um, both design and produce hard surface uh, sculpts you know, that aren't just your typical uh, pieces and aren't maybe just like a chair or you know, a violin but are going to be more sci-fi and also kind of show off this new flair, this next flair in your portfolio to show that you can really, you know, you can really put something together. You can bring some design to it. And uh, one of the testimonials, one of the responses we got from Alex's class, a lot of it had to do with the design side of it, the design rules that Alex presented with you guys. So if you want to know more about that, go to the page, gameartinstitute.com. You go to courses and you can pick Alex's class and you go to the middle of that page and enter your name and email. There you go. You'll be able to see uh, a good bit of that um, for free to give you a sense of the class. So uh, I think we are about out of time, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So any more questions, guys, let me know. I think Cameron's asking about ZBrush, but uh, that's, all of that stuff is so new. It's not... It's, it's, it's a totally different beast than this, which is production and, and, a, and a level of detail that you have to reliably create. So, um, so it's all max. Um, now, any more questions? You guys know where to find me. You can post comments to these videos on Facebook, on Twitch, on YouTube, uh, and I will post a higher res version of this. Uh, as soon as we get this thing kind of wrapped up, I'll just add it into there, and I'll add a link in uh, Twitch, uh, Facebook, and YouTube. And remember, head over to GameArtInstitute.com if you want to uh, learn more about the course and take a free lesson. Uh, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy, and I look forward to uh, seeing you guys in the class. It's starting pretty soon. So get yourselves in there. All right, and uh, there's a bonus. We're going to add in a bonus of Alex explaining all of Keyshot. I think you had like five lectures, Alex, on Keyshot. So we uh, pulled those all together in a nice little thing that we can add to people um, who take this new class. Cool. All right. All it's right. Nice to talk to everybody. Yep. Great. Thank you, Alex, so much for joining me. Yep. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm going to try to figure out how to turn these things off since I'm broadcasting in God knows <laughs> how many places. <laughs> All right, man. Take care. Thanks for coming out on uh, on a work day. Yeah, of course. It's nice to see you guys.
All right, guys on GoToWebinar, there we are. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Aletta, Rudy, Ahmed. Make it, make it happen, Ahmed. Make it happen. All right, guys, talk to you later. Uh, have a fantastic uh, weekend.